So uh, my name is Charles Adetloy. Um, I'm an MLOps engineer at Mavencode, and I have my colleague here, Alex. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, um, hello. Um, so my name is, sorry about that. Hello, hello. Um, one sec. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry, it's it's a little light. Um, yeah, I'm Alexander Lerma. Um, I've been working with Charles for quite a few years now, and uh, we do uh, machine learning and MLOps uh, work at uh, yeah at a uh, at a few different companies. Uh, we've worked with Fortune 500 companies and startups, and uh, we're looking forward to showing you what we got today. So, uh, Mervin Code is a company based out of Dallas. We do a lot of um, AI solutioning. So, we're Google Cloud partners and um, Amazon partners, AWS partners as well. So, the agenda for today is for us to talk about um, uh, Qflow I mean, making uh, uh, ML ops deployment for uh, cloud agnostic infrastructure. So, we're going to make a case for that how you can deploy your infrastructure, uh, your Beam jobs and Kuben with Kubernetes on different cloud providers and on prem. Um, everything we do, we try to build it on Kubernetes so that we can have the uh, platform agnostic behavior. Um, we're going to show you how we orchestrate this, uh, save our jobs uh, using Agile workflow. So Agile workflow is a container, uh, Kubernetes native way of deploying our workflows, kind of like what Airflow does, but it's entirely on Kubernetes. And we'll show you how we structure our team to have an agile approach uh, to this implementation. Then uh, we'll try to share some of the lessons we've learned in this process. Uh, with you guys. So uh, making a case for cloud agnostic machine learning deployment. So uh, the whole idea is like, oh, we do a lot of consulting in this space and we don't want to be tied to one particular cloud infrastructure, uh, mainly uh, running entirely on a managed service. So what we've done is to basically abstract the whole process of running all these, uh, all our BIM workloads and be able to like containerize it, put it on Kubernetes and be able to like deploy it across all the infrastructure work, I mean, all the cloud providers out there and for some of our on-prem customers. So um, we do a lot of things around machine learning and for any machine learning projects, you're basically sourcing data or you're building data pipelines and you're basically preparing the data, putting it in a feature store or a place where you can have the model, pull the data and do some training. So um, a typical workflow for ML uh, operations looks like this. You have various data sources. Uh, you curate the data sets. You do a lot of data wrangling. Um, you explore the data to make sure things are okay. You create the feature sets you need. And you do performance tuning. Uh, basically train your model multiple times. Then you get an output model and you stage it for model monitoring and, and things like that. So, but doing all this is a little bit challenging. Um, you need to, over time, if you're a big shop doing th this thing, it might be easy because you have a pattern. But if, like, if you're like a small size company or a startup and you're trying to do this, uh, you write a lot of all these algorithms, you have your Jupyter notebook, but it's not easy to reproduce. Uh, your components are not reusable. Uh, it's not easy to like manage your workflow as things grow. And automating the whole process might be a little bit of a pain because different people have different ways of doing things. And if you're running on AWS, you're probably married to AWS. Or if you're running on Google and you're connected to all the Google managed service, it's difficult to shift and lift all the knowledge you've acquired and apply it on the other platforms. So um, building ML workflows in reality, from my experience, could be very complex. Uh, you have many data sources. Um, some of them are siloed across different locations in the organization. You have different data protection requirements, GDPR, uh, PI data, um, and the availability of the data. Some data are like streaming, some are like batch, and some takes a while to come, and you have different permissions and requirements, constraints, and things like that. So uh, to just Put that visually, um, this is a typical organizational structure from all our consulting experience where we see data coming in from all these different sources. And you want to make the data available for the ML engineers and data engineers to quickly do data wrangling, understand the data sets you need, and stage it for data scientists to like uh, uh, basically uh, start training and running the models and everything you need. So 
This is like you go through many iterations. Once you have your model, then you deploy the model, you put it into production, you monitor the model to make sure things are working as expected. So um, it's a little bit complex putting all these things together, especially if you're consulting, there are different um, restrictions or constraints within all these organizations. So uh, our approach to doing this is to find a way that makes it very efficient for our team to function so that we can quickly roll out uh, proof of values POCs for our customers to see what we're doing and see what value we can create for them uh, by building their ML ops infrastructure. So we have a polygon team. Uh, Alex does a lot of scholar. Um, we have a lot of people doing Python. So one of the things we try to do is to basically see how we can uh, containerize all the workflows that we run. So once we have it in a Docker container and the job runs, we can put it on Kubernetes. And we use Apache Beam a lot, uh, basically for the portability, uh, the fact that uh, you can uh, you have different Beam SDKs, the Java SDK, the Python SDK, and the portability approach makes it easy to keep extending Beam. So there might be a Rust SDK in the future. Uh, they have a TypeScript SDK right now. So uh, once we've done that, uh, we build reusable components, and these components can now be abstracted to run a unit of work. So we have things that we have a component that basically connects to Kafka, uh, configured, and you can pull data from Kafka, or it pops up queue, and you have the data writer components that you can use to write uh, output data. We have the feature store components that we use to like connect to feature stores that you basically use to create, curate the feature stores, uh, um, objects or entities that you need to uh, train your model. And um, the other thing we do a lot is to try to build this up into a workflow. So that's where I will come into play and Alex is gonna talk about it in a little bit. So overall, we leverage this approach so we can take the knowledge we've acquired around Beam, around building uh, ML workflows and be able to like uh, transfer the knowledge if we're building things on Azure, or if we're building these on, um, let's say AWS and things like that. So, um, um, the whole approach uh, with, BIM, with the BIM philosophy is that you can basically have different people working with different languages as long as you write it with the SDK. And you can basically have someone working with a BIM Java, someone working with BIM Python or, or the Golang version of BIM. And you have a pipeline runner and you can just basically target all the different runners. So the advantage for us is like, uh, we can we basically can do things uh, with the streaming and the batch data sets. We have multi-language support. So different engineers or different people on our team can work with what they're comfortable with. And um, you can quickly test things on a local runner and things like that. So um, extending this beyond Beam, um, what we've done is to basically add the Kubernetes abstraction layer to this. So in addition to the portability that you have with Beam, we want to have the infrastructure portability so that you can basically um, run everything on Kubernetes and you can put that Kubernetes on-prem in the cloud or, or, or basically test it on your local um, mini cube setup or your Docker desktop. So uh, Kubernetes basically affords us that opportunity to have uh, the portability of infrastructure, kind of like the way Beam allows you to do uh, the portability at the code level and things like that. So uh, the advantages of this for us is we can basically leverage uh, Beam's multi-language semantics, uh, multiple language supports. We can build things on the Beam libraries, uh, things like TFX, uh, Beam SQL is coming out and it's gonna be very interesting so that you can qu quickly query what's going on in your data sets. And the connector IOs are already exist in Java. Uh, we can leverage it in, um, in the Beam Python. And we containerize all these things as units of work. So we have a functionality. We basically make it into a Docker container that we can share with other team members and things like that. Uh, the other thing around this is the portability, like I said earlier, that uh, Kubernetes affords. And uh, one of the, uh, the biggest thing we see uh, from our team is like we can easily and quickly ramp up new members of the team because we have similar environments. Everything is all abstracted and running on Kubernetes. And it's easy to debug. Uh, one of the big things you see when you're writing Beam codes is like, you have to like deploy your job, run it on the, on, on the cloud. If you're running against the cloud infrastructure, check the logs and stuff like that. But you can subsample your data sets and try things out on your local before you scale it out and deploy it up in the cloud. 
So uh, building it's all on Kubernetes. Uh, our infrastructure uh, stack kind of looks like looks like this, where you have the beam Java layer that gives it the portability at the, for the developer. You have the runner infrastructure. So you can basically, uh, there are different kinds of runners, uh, but, and these runners are being developed by different uh, teams and organizations. So you have some capabilities in, in Flink that are in SPAC, and you have the data flow runner, you have all the runners. So one of the goals is to be able to like switch between the runners. So the portability of uh, being makes that easy for us. And in, at the infrastructure level, uh, we have the portability across the infrastructure uh, with Kubernetes. So um, going through the portability implementation, which is something that is uh, relatively new in Beam, uh, you have the portability model that basically allows you to take a Beam Java code or a Beam Python code. Uh, you target it against the uh, run API, it converts it into the portal, and the portal basically allows you to target different runners. So there's a standard spec that basically allows you to build a runner for uh, for the Beam uh, for the Beam SDK you're using, and that runner basically can now be used to deploy uh, your uh, your Beam code in different environments. So uh, just to abstract what you ju you've just seen, you don't have to go through all these as a developer. Uh, you can pick whatever Beam environment you're running on. And there's something called the job service, which basically is an endpoint that abstracts all the runner implementation. So you start with like your Beam job, uh, which is right here, uh, your Python code or your Java code. You have the job service endpoint that basically talks to your cluster. In this case, it could be the Spark or the Flink cluster. And you can now submit your job to the job service endpoint. The job service endpoint will convert it to the proto formats, and that format basically converts and submits your job to the SPAC or the plain cluster. So, and the cool thing about this is like you can now have the cluster either running locally on the Minikube or on your Docker desktop, or you can target like a production grid Kubernetes infrastructure because. We're running on Kubernetes, so once you have the YAML description, you can either deploy the Kubernetes on local, or you can deploy it in the cloud. So the advantage of this right away for us, for us uh, is basically we can leverage the I.O. Uh, implemented in Beam Java uh, and port it across Python or Go. So we have, you can easily make the data available to like our data scientists and other member of the teams. We use the expansion API uh, with external transforms in Java API to make Java API calls where that's not possible. So um, this is how the architecture looks as a developer working with this implementation uh, approach. We have, a, you can have your local Minikube or your production on-prem or managed service environments. You, have, or you write your BIM code, it's all Dockerized and you basically submit it to the job service endpoint. The job service endpoint can either be talking to a Flink or Spark. In this case, we're talking to a Spark cluster. This is a master, and these are the runners, and everything runs on the uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. Now, you can mirror the same thing and have it on your local on a small scale. So where you have a mini cube or a Docker desktop running an instance of Kubernetes in your local, and you can have the Spark set up with the master and the, and the workers, and you have your job service. And you can basically submit the same job to this endpoint. So that way you can test things on your local. If everything is okay, then you can now transfer it and run it um, on, a, on, the product, on the production scale server. So um, managing and deploying the resource on Kubernetes could be a little bit uh, of a pain, but one thing we've done a lot is to leverage customize, which is a way for you to like package Kubernetes manifest that contains all the libraries you want to de uh, deploy. So you basically, we package it, we customize, and we can apply customize on the, on the cluster. Uh, we can target different environment with something called overlay. That means you can override the base behavior of the uh, Kubernetes YAML and uh, basically um, extend it so that you can deploy it to any environment. So you can do a dev deployment, state deployment, all in one click. And we can target different environments or different Kubernetes infrastructure as long as you have a, a cube cartoon running on the uh, infrastructure. Then it's easy for us to like track things. So basically, uh, BIM project, the BIM project is really evol evolving a lot fast, very fast. So one thing we've been able to do is to just track the version of SDK we're running, the version of libraries that we're running against, and things like that, so that we can do continuous improvements uh, to our environments and setups. 
So um, in terms of how we deploy the infrastructure, we maintain a Spark manifest and a Git repo, repo. So the developer or the data scientist or the ML engineer can go in, grab the latest Spark manifest and the deployments that we want to make. And you can apply the same thing to your local and apply the same uh, Spark manifest or Flink manifest if you're running Flink to deploy all the components that you need. Then you can now submit your job uh, to the endpoint. In that case, you have the cluster running. You can submit all the things you need to submit to your cluster through the job service runner that allows you to write your portable code. So I'm just gonna show a quick demo of how all these things fit together. Uh, we try, we pre-recorded it just to make it easy. So we use um, scaffold uh, to build the containers. So uh, the scaffold basically builds the doc, uh, Docker containers that we need. In this case, we have Docker containers with Flink, uh, Spark. Um, we're running Spark in this demo. So the Spark contains the Spark master and the working nodes. So we can basically build and deploy it. So once we've done that, we have all the customized packages that allows us to like deploy this, uh, the Spark and everything on the cluster. Uh, we have a make file script that basically we use as an helper script to like quickly run each of the commands. So this is a Spark uh, deployment YAML. This is a cluster running on my desktop. And um, once we deploy it, we can see the services we've deployed. So uh, I think I clicked the video. So basically, um, we can look through and see all the things we have in the namespace. In this case, we want to look at all the pods. We have the job service. We have the Spark Master, the Walker. Uh, we have two Walkers, so you can decide to scale it up or scale it down. So um, the next thing we try to do is to. Uh, We check the logs to see all the running service. So in this case, we have a Spark cluster running uh, on the master node and we have a job service. That's the job service. The job service uh, run talks to the Spark master. So we submit, uh, we submit a, a Spark job to the job service and the job service translates it and send it to the Spark master node. Um, so this is the, um, the logs from the, I think the Spark master. So we have the Spark master running, everything running on my local instance of the Docker container. So just to validate that, we'll go to the UI and see the Spark cluster running on my uh, Minikube. So I can simulate the same thing that we have in prod on my local uh, uh, Docker desktop environment. So what we're trying to do out there is to submit the, uh, the Python beam job. So, uh, so we have all our Python jobs and all our source code, all the source code for our different beam jobs running out there. So what we've done right now is to submit the Spark job, uh, uh, the Python uh, beam job to the uh, job service endpoint and the job service endpoint will translate it and submit it to the Spark cluster. So uh, that's what we have out here. So we have two worker nodes. We have the we have the application we've just submitted uh, through the job service endpoint uh, running with Python. Okay. Oh, where is the other slide? So, uh, so with Apache BIM and Kubernetes, we we have uh, we gain portability across uh, development environments. Just to react to it, it's easy to leverage the, uh, all the functionalities of the Apache BIM libraries, especially the Java SDK. It since it's more mature than any other library out there for BIM. Then we can use a customized manifest to deploy things on our 
cluster, either Spark or the Flink cluster. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex, who's going to talk about how we basically compose this into workflow and run it uh, with Argo. OK, so um, pretty much uh, it's what we did was we take all of our um, Beam jobs and we split it into multiple containers to allow basically multiple teams to work on different aspects of the workflow. Um, once the containerized, we can define Argo workflows that will um, create a DAG of the jobs. And basically, we can visually watch the workflow complete on the Argo UI. Um, so some of the reasons that uh, we use Kubernetes was the portability. And um, we wanted to be able to not only choose our language, but also choose our infrastructure, whether we're using GKE, EKS, or Minikube. But we also needed a way to define uh, the like how to stitch the um, Beam jobs together. Um, so we used Argo workflows to make that happen. Um, and in order to like um, say define dependencies between the workflows, uh, Argo allows you to say um, only execute this container after uh, these have completed. And uh, so it's kind of a perfect match for Beam. Um, Beam basically uh, gives us all these tools out of the box for these data pipelines. And Argo gives us the orchestration of the pipeline um, in a Kubernetes uh, native way. Um, and um, yeah, it allows us to create multi-step workflows. Um, sometimes some of the steps in the workflows take a little bit longer, or um, they have two dependencies instead of one. Uh, and sometimes the dependencies may be like an hour uh, time in between each other. Um, and uh, Argo helps us uh, compose these DAGs very easily. Um, so for this example, we have a, uh, a little mini uh, toy workflow that we created. Um, it, it reads from Kafka and it goes through the uh, feature transform, splits the data set and does training and testing. Um, and we're going to show uh, a demo of that. Um, here's the um, actual DAG that's defined as an Argo workflow. Um, you take basically all these tasks right here and each task is broken down into its own Docker container and each container uh, hands off to one another. Um, with whatever storage you want in between the steps. Um, we've used uh, GCS and uh, S3 buckets um, as our storage in between steps. Um, as a result of submitting the Argo workflow, you get this really nice uh, visualization of the DAG. Um, and we have a recording of that happening live, but it's all running on Kubernetes. And here's what the result of a happy workflow looks like. Um, so I'm going to submit the manifest that I showed you. Um, just another look at the manifest and what we're submitting to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can see that there's uh, depends clauses here. Uh, so each step only happens after its dependency is completed. I applied it to the cluster. Now I'm going to go to the UI by port forwarding to Argo's uh, UI server, and we can take a look at what's going on. You can see the workflow that just got submitted. Um, the DAG itself is not going to complete the first circle until the full thing is done. So it read from Kafka. Now it's going through its enrichment. Once this is done, the, the following steps can continue. Sorted. Yep. Yep. The data set split. And you can see that these two jobs start in parallel. Um, so it allows you to have uh, parallel tasks triggered off of one dependency. Okay. And it completes. So um, another thing that we um, 
have a use case for is uh, event-driven uh, creation of these DAGs. Um, Argo Events allows you to use uh, what we use in this demo is a schedule-based uh, event. And it's pretty much like a cron job that will uh, send an event to trigger a workflow. And it will create the workflow that you just saw. Um, so it's like a layer on top of just the Argo workflow, um, something orchestrating the creation of the workflow. Argo events can be used with um, PubSub, Kafka, any sort of data source. Um, and it allows you to create Argo workflows on the fly. Um, we have another demo where it just kind of shows you the different components of an Argo event. Um, it's composed of a sensor um, and a, a source. Uh, here's a look, quick look at the YAML for the sensor. And it defines, uh, in order for this event to be triggered, it needs to, there's two possible uh, sources. We have an hourly and we have a 30 minute, every 30 minutes uh, workflow is triggered. Um, so, so let me fast forward a little. As a result, you have these uh, Argo workflows, one of them that's spinning up every hour. It's going to run the full DAG and another one that does it every 30 minutes. Um, so that's Argo events. And calendar is kind of like a very um, straightforward um, use case. But again, you can use PubSub or Kafka as your data source. Calendar is just uh, a good toy example. And yeah, I'm going to hand it back off to Charles for the Agile, uh, and how we use all this in an Agile way. Yeah, thanks. So uh, one of the things we try to do, and to be a little bit more efficient in terms of, a lot of the times we have to be a quick proof of value to demonstrate the validity of the solution we're proposing to a customer. So uh, we have a way of building our components in a more collaborative way so that we can split up the task. So what we have right here is like, you have an ML engineer building, uh, let's say a component that basically pulls the data, we containerize it. Then we version it, uh, we basically tag it, we like the Git version, uh, the Git commit version from the code, from the GitOps process. So the BIM job then is to pull the data and present it to the next stage is all abstracted within this component. Then you can have another ML engineer working in parallel, uh, picking up these components as a dependency, uh, the Argo workflow that Alex just showed, and basically consuming it and things like that. But over time, requirements change and you want to roll out a new version and you just don't want to like go modify a particular component and you break the entire pipeline. So we basically track the version, the version that's changed. We get the updates. If the version can still be dependent on the uh, on this previous step that is still working, we can basically point it to that. So we can maintain multiple version until uh, we basically uh, stop using the old version and, uh, uh, and basically move on to the new version. So all the data scientists and people depend, they can basically consume the service because it's all containerized. They can basically connect to it, uh, run the workflow pipeline and be able to like uh, basically do what they're doing without fearing that the code might not be working properly because we changed some things on the workflow. So that's one way that we quickly use to like iterate through the entire life cycle of uh, building all these pipelines and making sure we're not stomping each other as we basically try to roll out all these things. So um, each beam jump runs in a container as a, for this to work, we need to make sure that each of the beam jobs are running, uh, run on in a container as a manageable unit. Uh, we're able to like version and track it. So we basically track it with the Git version commit, kind of like following the GitOps model. Uh, the pipeline is implemented with Agro workflow. So all the pipelines that Alex showed earlier, we can basically track and run multiple pipelines, especially when you're doing things like uh, model tuning and hyperparameter tuning and things like that. You want to run multiple experiments with different features that they've been created. So we make sure that all these pipelines are version and they're trackable. And um, they output artifacts from the model uh, from the from the pipeline, which in most cases are the model that you've trained, we can bash and tag it and save it into uh, a Google storage bucket or S3 bucket, depending on what environment we're running on. 
So um, the versioning aspect can happen in multiple ways. Uh, one, in this case, uh, if a developer is working and trying to release a new component, and, uh, let's say we have a feature loader component that connects to the previous component, you basically tag it, create a new version, and that new version can now be deployed and you can run with that. Uh, the other thing is like the pipeline basically evolves over time as you build more applications or you enrich the application. You may need to like uh, reconstruct the pipeline. It gets a little bit more complex. So we can roll back if something fails and if, so if something is breaking. So we have a version of the pipelines as well on the Argo uh, deployment. So uh, the lessons learned and a quick summary. Alex, you want to go through this? Yes. Um... So basically we have uh, some of the problems that we faced um, uh, like building out these workflows and our solutions. So reproducibility, uh, we're using Argo workflows and Kubernetes. Uh, reusability, we use containerization, Docker, uh, Argo workflows for the pipelines and Beam APIs. Manageability, we use uh, Beam portability as opposed to like a direct Spark runner. Uh, we use the job service with that. Um, infrastructure portability with K8s, um, Argo workflows and configurable runners, and automation. We use GitOps to kind of manage all this um, on Kubernetes. Um, well, the portable runner was, um, it took us a bit to, uh, you know, get move over from the Spark runner, but it was a great, um, you know, great experience after we did that. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been smooth sailing for us. Um, and uh, yeah, basically everyone's been uh, able to collaborate very easily with uh, the portable uh, method that we went about. Um, and uh, running these jobs uh, locally are um, it's a lot cheaper than having to have a managed uh, EKS cluster all the time. Uh, so local devs are able to cheaply uh, run these reproducible workflows um, and basically reproduce it in, in production very easily. Yeah, that's it.